Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to welcome to our webinar at Centre for London. It's absolutely great to have you here today to talk about the about public involvement in planning, and particularly the launch of our manifesto, making the case for better public involvement in planning. We're so very pleased to have you all with us. We know there's lots and lots of competition. There are so many events going on at the moment um, in the lead up to the mayoral election. So thank you for choosing this one. My name's Claire Harding. I'm the research director here at Centre for London, and I'll be your chair today. Um, before we get started, just a few words on Centre for London and why we're holding this event. As many of you will already know, I hope, we're the capital's dedicated think tank. We develop new solutions to London's critical challenges, and we advocate for a fair, sustainable and prosperous global city. We publish research, stage events, just like this one. Maybe this year, later this year, some of them will actually not be online, and we convene an influence. We've partnered with Footwork to put together this manifesto, so thank you very much to Footwork for their support with this, and particularly Claire Richards, because we agree with them that Londoners need to be much, much more involved in shaping the way our city is built and managed. Engaging Londoners in the planning process is a good thing for all sorts of reasons, and my colleague Richard will talk in much more detail about those reasons in a few minutes, and I'm sure it will be a key topic of our discussion as well. Um, but in very broad terms, we know that it improves the quality of the developments that get built. Um, it might help to actually deliver more developments quicker. It boosts well-being and motivation, and most fundamentally, perhaps, everyone has, in our belief, a right to have a genuine say in what their built environment, what their community is like. In our manifesto, we've laid out clear recommendations for the next elected mayor, whoever they are, to strengthen public engagement in our planning system and get communities involved in new and much needed developments. We're delighted to be working in collaboration with this, on this project with Collective Community Action, who are a really interesting group. If you don't already know them, do look them up on this manifesto. And thanks again to Footwork. And now I'm really pleased to introduce my colleague Richard Brown, who um, is the acting director here at Centre for London. Um, we're in what we're calling an interregnum rather grandly between directors at the moment, um, who will present the recommendations from this manifesto. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I was going to make a joke about acting director not being something at the National Theatre, but I'm, I haven't worked that one out yet. Um, it's Great to be here and it's great to be able to launch this uh, piece of work I and mean, we for a few years have been concerned about the quality of public engagement in London and the development process. The rate of change has obviously been phenomenal in a lot of London's neighbourhoods um, but there's a sense that communities are feeling left behind, marginalised and you see that in some of the well publicised and uh, disruptive for all concerned uh, disputes around uh, big new developments across the city. Um, I'm also conscious we're publishing this today on the very day that the uh, London plan has been launched, um, which is, and just shows that I think preparing the London plan is one of these fourth bridge type, painting the fourth bridge type exercises. The moment one has been launched, the next one is prepared. And there's some good stuff in the London plan and in what's been implemented under this mayor. Um, the um, estate ballots has been a very positive uh, development um, and there's been positive developments as well, like the Talk London panel. But we think that uh, in the next mayoralty, whoever wins, uh, we need to go a lot further. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the why, the how and the what. Uh, the why Claire's already um, outlined. Uh, fundamental to that I guess is you know as citizens we have a dem democratic right to be involved in the way our neighbourhoods change. Um, democracy especially now in the digital age can't be limited to this once every four years exercise of the ballot box. It's about something which is about which enables more sustained and engaged participation in determining the future of our city, co-producing it even. Um, the second is um, there's good evidence that um, being more involved in decisions about one's local area actually improves well-being, motivation, improves one's uh, mental health and one's sense of engagement in the local area and improves community health as well. Third, um, it improves the quality of what gets built. Um, some buildings in London, some new developments in London look like they've landed uh, from another planet into a sense uh, perhaps they have. Um, we know that sustained community involvement builds on local knowledge. This isn't a concession to local interests. This is a way of actually getting more expertise into a development is working better with local communities. And finally, um, and perhaps as a byproduct of those first three rather than the central aim in itself, though uh, the speed of new development is important in London, it should increase the quantity of what gets built. We should enable London to meet our urgent housing needs better um, through better community engagement. So that's the sort of rationale, some of which may be, I'm sure in this audience particularly, um, stating the obvious. The how, um, 
you know, there's an enormous amount of evidence uh, about what works and what good practice looks like in community engagement. And we've just summarized in this uh, manifesto a few of those um, principles. Um, the first is that uh, public engagement needs to be informed. Uh, it needs to really draw on the deep knowledge and understanding of the local area that local communities have. Um, it should be a dialogue rather than a matter of telling local people what's going to change and hoping for a reaction. It should be drawing on that expertise to start with. And we've talked quite a lot in the uh, manifesto and outside about place-based audits as a way of getting that really systematized understanding of local knowledge. Second is it should be early. Um, there's long been a challenge, and I think it's partly a challenge that's locked into our planning system, where engagement comes right at the end of a process where there's a binary choice, whether something's approved or pushed back. Early engagement should help to shape a proposal so that it works for local people as well as for developers and planning authorities. Um, it should be sustained, I, particularly in London. Um, big development projects take place over several years, even several decades, and that does not feel like and in that context, you can't really have a planning uh, public engagement process that lasts six months and then goes away. So over a long term, over a long term development project that could take generations even, and um, needs to be sustained engagement and the continuing dialogue. Um, engagement needs to be diverse. London is diverse. Londoners are an incredibly uh, mixed bunch of people and communities. Um, we talk times, and I've been guilty of doing this myself, about hard to reach communities. It's become a truism now to say that there aren't hard to reach communities. There's just not trying hard enough to reach everyone. Um, and particularly now we have um, digital engagement tools. We can run events during the day. We can run things online at different times of day. So finding ways that actually reach out to all different parts of the community, which probably means understanding what the community is before you do that, is really important. Not all events should be during the day. Not everything should involve going to a meeting. Not everything should be online. You can't achieve that sort of diversity of interaction through one medium alone. Um, next, and there are only six of these, uh, <laughs> engagement should be transparent. And um, this has been a, a hobby horse of mine for a while is that engagement is often um, in a world of wonderful CGI images and aspirational statements that never actually talks much about money. And I always find that slightly patronizing. Uh, you know, people, most people doing development are working on a financial model of some sort. And actually being clear about where some of the trade-offs are and being clear about um, the viability and how viable the assessments work, I think is really important as part of having a more grown-up discussion um, about new development. And lastly, um, all these processes need to be supported. We need better training for people working in local authorities, for people working in developers. We also need to recognise that when local people are giving their time and giving their expertise, they're doing the development process a favour and at times they need to be paid for that. There needs to be uh, fair compensation. So those are the principles we believe should be um, embedded in better public engagement in London. And our recommendations, our principal recommendation, I suppose, is that there should be a mayoral statement of community involvement. Statements of community involvement are part of every planning application. They're part of every local development plan. Um, the mayor doesn't have those obligations on him or her at the moment. Um, we think they should. We think those should apply to how the mayor and the mayor's agencies seek to engage on their own projects. Obviously, there's a big... Uh, a big program of uh, Transport for London development roll, still rolling out at the moment. They should apply to how the mayor consults on the London plan and subsidiary plans themselves. And they should apply to what the mayor champions and pushes um, in uh, borough plans. So that's our main ask on the mayoral candidates is to commit to um, issuing a mayoral statement of community involvement, setting out how they'll do these things. And this should be part of the next review of the London plan. We believe there needs to be uh, more attention paid to skills, um, pro a training programme that works for councillors, works for local community advocates. We believe also the mayor should be seeking along the lines of his design advocates to have community advocates who can help actually bring the right community voices to the table. We believe there needs to be a systematised knowledge base. Again, and I'm sure people here will have experience of this. Some of the areas of London that have seen a lot of change they have the same type of community engagements going on over and over again. And I think people are as much feel unincluded in community engagement as sometimes over involved and ask the same questions over and over again. So building that knowledge base of what's known about local areas is really important. Um, we believe there need to be better incentives. And one of those could be an accreditation scheme um, that um, you know, recognises where boroughs and where developers are adopting best practice in terms of public engagement and helps to push the standard up as the good work standards has done in London. 
in terms of working practices. And we've argued there should be a scorecard that helps London's councillors um, to assess how good the community engagement has been. These type of models are being developed more and more for design issues. Um, I think community engagement should be seen as part of that process as well. So that's an overview of our manifesto. I'm really uh, pleased to be launching it today and we really hope it will, it's something we've been pushing to the mayoral candidates when we spoke to them and their teams, and we hope it will make a real difference to this debate. Um, I suppose in closing, um, you know, it's been a rough, rough old year um, and it's been tragic for many people. Um, but I suppose two things we've seen coming out of uh, the COVID crisis has been, we've seen the strength and the resilience of a lot of our communities. And we've seen the importance of their built environment to people. We've all been much more in our homes, in our local areas, spending much more time there. And as we come out of this, as we recover, we need to bring those together. We can't continue uh, looking at communities on the one hand and then changing, changing the built environment without reference to them. So in a way that stronger community impulse and that importance attached to the built environment need to inform how we see our city changing as we come out of this crisis. Claire, back to you. Thank you very much, Richard. That was a far better summary of this work than I could ever possibly have given. Um, but if you're interested in reading more about this, I can see from looking at the people in the audience that many of you are very expert indeed already. Um, on our website, you can find a full copy of the manifesto, a list of sources um, and links to places that will take you to both more background information and um, more kind of practical examples and please do keep sharing those with your fellow participants in the chat as well um, and also what we're rather pretentiously calling a long read essay which was my chance to write 2000 words without anybody telling me Claire that's far too long um, in a lot more detail about why we think this stuff is really important and talking about what some of the pitfalls are, what some of the issues are, and how those can be avoided, potentially be avoided. Um, and my colleague Diana has just popped, popped the link on the chat now so we can read it online. Um, for the rest of this session, um, I'm going to ask our panellists to share their response to the research. Um, then we'll get a bit of a discussion going and we'll take questions um, from the audience. As, as Diana's already said in the chat, um, there's a Q&A function in Zoom, which you're probably all terribly familiar with by now because I'm sure you've been doing this far more times than you would choose to count. Um, if someone's asked a question that seems a little bit like the question that you were thinking of asking, um, please upvote their question and then it will magically float to the top rather than asking another question that's similar. That really, that really helps us to see what the, priority, what the priorities are in our audience. What are the absolutely burning questions that we really need to see answered? Um, we know that some people are following this event on YouTube rather than with us here on Zoom. Um, if that's you, you could feed in questions on Twitter using the hashtag Mayor for Communities. That's for the number four, Mayor for Communities. And our comms team will feed those in to the chat, to the Q&A function. And they will also um, be able to be upvoted in exactly the same process. And we'll try to get through as many questions as we can before the end of the session, because I'm sure there will be very many, very good ones. I'd like to introduce our brilliant panel for today. Um, first, we have Simon Donovan, who's the CEO at the L London Development Trust. Um, he's a social regeneration specialist and um, the CEO of the Manor House Development Trust, sorry. Um, he's developed a really unique approach to community development and social regeneration, um, which I'm sure he'll talk about now, and delivered really long lasting community development on regen projects across London boroughs of Tower Hamlet, Southwark and Waltham Forest. Next, we have Alede Obo, who is the Director of Partnerships at First Base now, but before that, she's done all sorts of interesting things from managing comms at Marks and Spencers to working on large scale regeneration in um, Hackney and leading on external relations for the East Village, which is the new neighbourhood in the Olympic Park and a particularly interesting one to us here at Centre for London. And more, more recent experience also outside London, um, really interesting work on an arts and culture hub in Bristol and the um, tech led offer in Milton Keynes was looking at that Oxcam arc, but I'm sure some of you would have been know, know, know about and have been following with interest. And last but very much not least, we have Jessica Cargill Thompson, who's a public practice associate and the community engagement officer at Waltham Forest Council. Um, also a writer, editor, researcher, and all around very busy and interesting person. Um, as a member of the community group Action OKR, she's organised events to raise local awareness of regen around South London's Old Kent Road, another really interesting regeneration area, including winning GLA funding for an urban room, which is a really interesting. I must stop saying really interesting, it's always true, but I decided very repetitive now you're all really interesting um, model for 
engaging the public in a different and maybe more more free flowing way. Um, and she's currently at Waltham Forest in the planning policy team where she's been leading on the statutory community consultation on the borough's draft local plan. So thank you so much. You're such an interesting group. Um, I'm going to start with Simon and ask why you think it's particularly important that we talk about public involvement in planning now in this election year and why the, why the mayoral candidates indeed should be bothered about it at all. And um, Links to that, I guess, why it's important that we involve Londoners of all ages, from all communities and from all parts of the city in this process. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Claire. I'll, um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for producing the manifesto and thank you to Footwork and to the Collective Community Action um, for all of their work on this. Um, my name's Simon Donovan. Uh, I've been living and working in regeneration in London um, from most of my life either campaigning for social housing back in the 1980s during the land grab to the London Docklands Development Corporation in Bermondsey and Rotherham, here where I live, or in the 90s in the Wolf of Forest Hat Estates, Housing Action Trust uh, Estates for councils, for housing associations. And lately we've been organising through trusts, um, social sustainability and uh, community development on Woodby Down in um, Acton Gardens. And I also write kind of visioning documents um, for a number of London developers um, across the city and as, um, as far out as Ebbsfleet. I suppose in all of this time, the thing that really strikes me about regeneration is the strength and the depth that there is uh, of talent that there is in London's uh, communities and how people sacrifice day in and day out to help their fellow citizens um, in their um, communities. And I think we've seen some absolutely fantastic examples of that during the pandemic uh, with food aid, emergency aid, um, protection of the environment. And, and I think really, if we're to build a better London, it is where he it is from this area, the community where social cohesion um, will come along. But I'm afraid the other truth that I've discovered through working in regeneration um, for all of those um, years is that the name regeneration and the people who do it have got a pretty bad name. Um, and this might be accusations of social cleansing in areas, uh, the reinforcing of class divides um, and the impression the regeneration is not about local uh, uh, communities. And I'd go even further than that. I would say if your area where you live, and I live in social housing and so on, if you are earmarked for regeneration, that that actually causes fear. Fear amongst people that they're going to be left out, people that it's not going to be for them. And I think from that fear, um, anger is generated uh, and it quickly generates. So we find ourselves, those who are involved in the industry, in this adversarial position with the communities that we're trying to, um, that, that we're trying to uh, benefit. Uh, and what we see is that the politicians driver to create more housing and the planners and designers, uh, uh, desires and drivers to, to, to build and design fantastic places to live in, and the developers' drive to create value is in contra uh, distinction to what the, the community wants. And it creates this adversarial position. Um, and the problem is, in all of this regeneration, right back since the 1980s, that community development, stewardship, and residents having a say is at best seen as an add-on. Um, or it's simply not planned and just left to chance. And in the family that makes up a regeneration, the partners of the regeneration, the community side is always the poorer cousin, and we are always treated as the poorer cousin. Um, so we've got a challenge. How do we bring these two things together? Um, you know, we have a real need to regenerate most of these, many of these estates that were built in the last century uh, and so on. How can we do this without getting into this adversarial position of conflict and win over communities so the regeneration actually meets their aspirations and what they want to achieve? So we've got an opportunity at the minute created in part by this um, profound changes that we've had uh, due to um, the way the city is functioning during the pandemic and what we'll see afterwards um, to bring in communities to the center uh, of these new neighborhoods that we want to um, develop uh, and which are being built as we speak. So myself, 
along with uh, colleagues um, from across the spectrum in collective community action, uh, came together and put, to, put, put, put forward this five point um, simple plan of what could be done to make this situation uh, uh, to make the situation better and put community in the driving seat, bring them to the center. So the first thing that we need is training. It needs to be well funded and it needs to be accessible. But who am I talking about? Who needs the training? Am I talking about the community needs training? What I'm talking about is the professionals need training. Yeah, those who are building these new areas in which we live in need to understand properly what social stewardship is about and what community development is about so that they can bring that in into their plans when they're doing it. And this is a culture change. Yeah, this is behavior change of the professionals that need to do it. And I think that we do that through well-funded um, uh, and clear um, training. The second thing I think that needs to have to happen, and so many times it doesn't happen, is there needs to be a clear understanding of what is already there. Um, and Richard talked about baseline service, uh, 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 baseline surveys, uh, and uh, uh, and so on. Um, when we're looking at an estate, we tend to focus on the challenges rather than celebrate what the communities and places already are. You know, place is a culmination of layers of history and layers of diverse communities that live there. Um, so yes, we need the place-based audits at the beginning, but that's not enough. The regenerations I work on, uh, 20 years long, things change. So and they're constantly changing um, due to socioeconomic uh, 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 changes. So we need to understand what the changes are going on. So this needs to be a continuous process through the regeneration period. Um, thirdly, we need to regulate the scrutiny. Um, we want to ensure that all of those that propose to regenerate our neighborhoods can be scored by a standard that applies to all. So we can measure the progress of community, uh, community stewardship, but we can also uh, compare like with like. We can take one regeneration and compare it with another, uh, another, uh, another regeneration. Um, the developers I work with are good. They do community development, they do stewardship, but not enough. Um, but too many developers pay lip service to it. And uh, the world is a very transparent place now and you can't get away with flanneling people anymore. People understand so much more. They have access to so much more um, information. Um, but I think um, that the word regeneration, that the good ones are treated the same as the bad ones. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a negative connotation on uh, all of them. Um, so we need a career process. Uh, of scrutiny, uh, which will bring community to the center of the stage and get some way from anecdote to having a more scientific approach to how we're measuring process. Part and parcel of that is the development of a kite mark. Um, developers and regenerations have all sorts of kite marks, best builder, environmental practice, and so on. Why isn't there one for social stewardship and community development? In that way, we can clearly see those who have been doing it before, those who are good at it, those who are making the decisions on council can immediately identify if someone who's done it or not. And those who have not doing it have got something to aspire to. It's a way of rewarding the good developers and uh, separating from them that are not, do, uh, um, they're not doing it. And finally, um, we need to recognise that the community is the weaker relation in all of this. And what we're calling for is some heavyweight political backing to community. And that's why we're calling for a London mayoral statement uh, on this in the May election. We want to see how our mayor is going to put our communities at the front of all of this in London. And um, that's a challenge for them. Uh, we think they're up to the challenge and we want to see um, what they've got to say uh, about this. So we have a real opportunity, I think, um, to make some profound changes in the way that we're doing um, uh, 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 regeneration and involving uh, community development. We want communities which are connected, empowered, have spaces in which they can flourish, they can influence what's going on, and importantly, they have organisations which are, which are able to do that. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Claire.
Thanks so much, Simon. So many, um, so many interesting topics to follow up there, but I'm sure other speakers will want to respond to as well. Um, I'd like to come to Alide next and ask you in particular why it's why it's important for developers and architects as well as for communities and local councils um, to take public participation in development seriously. And really interested if you could share an example of where good public engagement has really led to better place making because the in many ways that's what this is all about thank you absolutely and um, just a second Simon's point thank you so much for um, allowing us to get involved in report I think it's brilliant um, and I think it's a real um, testament to all the hard work that Centre of London has done so far and, and FT work as well um, I think as the only developer on this panel I, I, I hang my head in shame if I'm honest at some of the um, atrocities that our industry tends to um, claim is public engagement or community consultation when it really isn't. It's literally just information. It's providing information to people and expecting them to just basically agree. Um, and that's not that's not what consultation is, and that's not what engagement is. And and I think you know, as someone who's grew, I grew up in I grew I grew up in inner city London. I grew up in Hackney, um, and I was privy to many regeneration opportunities and consultations and many, many meetings that I went along to and thought, this is shambolic, this is not what we should, you know, this is not a proper way of engaging. I think as an industry, we just don't do it well. I think we are, as an industry, we are ter terrified about what's gonna come back. Um, and that's largely because by the time we engage people, we've pretty much decided what we're going to do. Um, again, which is not the right way to consult. You know, you've got to have a genuine process where people feel they can genuinely influence and be part of the decision making. So for me, that's one of the biggest barriers, you know, um, just the fear from the developer side, actually, about, about actually genuinely listening to what people have to say. Um, I think, secondly, I think as an industry, we are terribly undiverse um, and we basically, we, we like the sound of our own voices. Um, and as a result, listening to people with diverse opinions can be quite scary. You know, listening to people who have completely different approaches to where we, the way we see things can be quite scary. So for us, we, you know, as a business, we really focus on, on embracing and supporting, understanding that we're diversity of thought because we are all different. We all come across things in different ways. I was speaking to a counselor recently who was really frustrated that she goes along to lots of developments and you know, DDA compliance is really important. But she was also talking about she has a buggy and she just can't get her buggy up, you know, through a, a typical road because it's been designed not for people with double buggies. You know, simple, simple things like that that we just take for granted. Um, I think for, for me, the real important reason why we, we, we genuinely participate in, in, and get engagement, it's about building genuine relationships. This is about asking questions and listening. And, and making sure that there are real opportunities to, to implement change into the, into the scheme. Um, and it sounds so simple. <laughs> you know, it, is, it is, for me, it is basic 101, but it, it's, it's frightening how many times it doesn't get happen. It doesn't happen. So I think for me, the quality um, the, 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 and the, quanti the, the quality of the engagement it, or, of the scheme is so much richer if we take the time to really understand the motivations, the ambitions, what people really want, and actually have those honest conversations. I think as Simon said, sometimes we can't do everything. We absolutely can't do everything. Um, and there will be competing priorities. And it's always, you know, it's pressures around costs, pressures around program, pressures around all sorts of things, but it's being honest and upfront about those. And I think, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be scared to be able to say, actually, that's not deliverable, or that can't happen now, or we have to look at that in a different way. And for me, you asked me for an example, and that's an example. We have an example of a scheme we worked on in, in West London, where we walked into a really embattled environment. Local residents were really frustrated because it was a site owned by the council. Um, they had some ambitions of what they wanted on that site, and the council were going to dispose of the site, and every person who had come with a pre-app had very different views to the, to, to the local residents, and also hadn't, hadn't taken the time to actually speak to them to understand what they, what they would like. And we, we went into that conversation saying, well, as I said, very honest, you know, this site has to deliver, you know, affordable homes for local community, and so that comes at a cost. It has to deliver, you know, public space and all the other things that compete with your, you know, in, in your financial models. But we've got to have a grown up conversation about what this site can deliver. 
working with local residents, engaging them with the architects really early on, and went through a whole design review process with local residents. And as a result, out of that, there were some difficult conversations, don't get me wrong. There were some gifts on both sides. We had to be flexible. They had to be flexible. But in the end, we came, we, the, the end scheme was something that was collaborative. There was something that people felt they were engaged and involved in. And it was something that's it's, it's part of the community. And I, I'm, I'm always, one of the things I always say to people is, you know, we are only here for fleeting time, if we're, if we're honest. We're developers, we're here for a period of time. This is your community, your place, and actually it has to work for you long term. So for me, that was an example where we really got involved and helped to help to be part of a process, but had residents being part of the design process, you know, design review process, challenging the architects, you know, pushing them to be to to to, to be a bit more um, ambitious and to really listen to what their thoughts were. So for me, it ended up in a much much more richer scheme, a place that's loved and and respected by local people, and actually it was a role model for community engagement. Actually, because I think those res residents are now much more confident, much more empowered, and they can go into any other scheme now and say actually it was done here we've got to do it now and we've got to be you've got to give us opportunity um, elsewhere and I think for me you know that's one of the really strong points in the manifesto that I'm a big fan of it's about making sure that decisions by local authorities are made knowing that the depth of the engagement not just the quantity you know we talk people throw numbers of so 500 people engage that's great but actually is that depth of engagement rich enough have they had an opportunity to genuinely contribute to to the scheme development and the, the, the quality of that engagement as well should be should be should be reviewed so you know that's that's those are my thoughts thank you so much that that was so interesting and i really couldn't agree with your with the person you were speaking to more about buggies but that's probably, that's probably a different session um jessica i'd like to come to you next and ask you in particular about what the barriers are for, to local authorities to support good public engagement in the planning process. And I guess, similarly to that, how do you see the relationship between public involvement in planning, which we all think is a good thing, and representative in democracy in elections, which is another good thing? Thank you. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much for inviting me and um, I'm really excited by it. Um, and um, in particular, one of the points I'm particularly excited about is that you've recognised the need for funding and resources, um, because I think without that there is um, the risk of effectively just piling on more and more um, pressure onto already stretched councils. Um, so, for example, in our local plan engagement that we did last autumn, purely um, for some high street stalls and some um, evening online community engagement meetings, it, I, I calculated it was more than 230 additional officer hours, and that was at weekends and evenings. Um, and all, but also, um, I think something that Simon touched on as well, I think you, it's really important that you recognise the need for the funding and resources for the local community groups as well, rather than expecting people to give up their time. We know how, how, how much time it takes to read these really thick planning documents, never mind understand them or planning applications or attend a meeting or just even fill in the consultation form. Um, so it's a real privilege to be able to, to take part in a, in a planning, uh, in any engagement around planning or even to care about it. Um, and, you know, unless we recognise that, we're not going to have a, a truly representative cross-section of the community involved. And that, so that's something that's really important. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, skills and training. And um, as a public practice associate, um, I do you know, feel, um, and it's part of the public practice ethos, that there's um, quite a siloed approach to this. So... Um, there's a lot of architects and a lot of planners who do really, really ama you know, amazing engagement work and they're absolutely great. But I'm in, um, I've been put into this one, one year role. My background is as a journalist, an editor, um, and there's plenty of other people with transferable skills that make them suitable to do engagement roles. Um, uh, say teachers, um, people from the performing arts, people whose skills are taking something complex and then um, engaging the layperson with it, um, and they can be involved. Take you know, have the overview of the engagement strategy, while the people, the the planners and the architects, get on with the the very difficult, complex task of planning and designing. Because uh, this is where 
um, engagement always just gets tagged on, you know, not always, but can just get tagged on to the end of the process because the poor planners are there wrestling and wrangling these complex planning policy issues and producing the documents. And then it, the head, head comes up and it's, oh, we've, now we've got to do the engagement rather than it being being a support and something that's sort of you know, carry, carrying on in the background. And again, I think, you know, the word sustained has been used quite a lot. Um, I think that that's one way that, um, engage, that engagement can be sustained. Um, I think, you know, one of the um, other things that have been touched on already is the, um, uh, a, a, that's a, a problem for councils is, of course, we're not operating within a vacuum. There's not the privilege of, we, lis we listen to the local residents, we listen to the stake stakeholders, they say what they want, and then, you no, know, we know what we want, we can build it. We all know, everybody listening in knows that is not what, what happens at all. Um, everybody's beholden to developers who in turn beholden to um, viability and profits and um yeah i don't i don't have a magic bullet answer for how we how we deal with that but um uh transparency certainly could come into play openness um uh developers um actually showing people what they are what a scheme is actually going to look like rather than a kind of soft focus version of what they think people want to see it might also help um the one I'd say big one for local councils is council officers are, of course, apolitical, but we're, but are operating in a highly charged, highly political environment. And even, you know, the the best intended, um, best planned engagement can be derailed by. Um, <laughs> um, yes, other political agendas councillors warring with each other. Um, I think, yeah, I won't mention any examples because it's probably a bit imprudent for me to do so. Um, but I think uh, built environment and architecture is, is a very use, useful political football for um, councillors and planners, architects, developers can often just get caught in the middle of that. I think um, I'll stop there and... Um, Thank you, thank you, Jessica. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you, everybody, and thank you to the audience for putting in so many excellent questions and for and for upvoting them, which we really appreciate. Um, our first question comes from Michael Ball, and I guess touches quite a lot on what on what Jessica has just said. Um, and um, to, to paraphrase to paraphrase the question, which I'll do for all of them, and you can read the full ones in the chat. Um, everyone agrees that this is a good idea, but local authorities do sometimes resist, and that that is not a new phenomenon. Um, Michael asks, "Is this a function of centralising power, and how can we break through this reality?" Um, panelists, please jump in if, if you feel able to. Um, if, if not, I may, I may be forced to pick on you. Simon, you look like you might have frozen. Are you still with us? Could you just repeat the I'm, I'm looking for the question so I can read it. <laughs> oh, sure. Sorry, that there, um, in the Q&A, um, it's a top question in the Q&A. Uh, which one was from Michael? He's got several there. Um, the one, the one that's floated all the way up to the top. The top. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So I'm going to come back to my point about culture change. Yeah, and um, and I think kind of since probably before the 1980s, that what we see around regenerations are, are lots of egos and lots of uh, people, uh, if we're looking at councillors who, who are doing it for political reasons. Or they are people who um, don't really know about community development. They know about politics. They know how to get elected as a councillor. They know how to go for a political party. But that doesn't make them an expert in community. And the other thing I think is that a lot of our politicians um, at the minute, uh, local politicians and so on, um, don't take a strategic view to what's going on in their area. Um, they become like community activists um, uh, within um, within an area. So I don't think that it's um, it's part of a centralisation. I think this comes down to uh, human knowledge 
uh, and the way that we're taught that uh, regeneration should do. So I think kind of when I talk about training people, when I talk about um, uh, courses and things like that, what we are trying to do is instigate, or what we want to do is instigate culture change within them, behavior change within them. And that's about them looking away from what their drivers are, their political drivers are, which for most politicians, uh, you know, are about creating more homes for people to live in. I've got a big family in London. Don't get me wrong. I want to see more homes in, uh, uh, in London. I want my family to be able to um, li li live behind me. Um, but um, um, so... Yes, that 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 you know we need we need more homes, but how do those communities hang together? And I don't think that there is enough emphasis on that whatsoever. I don't think people are trained um, to uh, what to, to look out for. So I think that that is um, uh, um, that's what's fundamentally at, at fault. We've been through lots of different iterations of planning. You know, we're going to make it better here, and we're going to make it better there. It didn't seem to change anything in my experience from the 1980s to now. Um, so there's something else going on there that we need to um, um, that, that, that we need to address. The other thing is the model on which we build homes, which is mainly in London about extracting value. And if we only have that as our driver, um, then I'm afraid uh, community will always remain that poorer cousin, will always be second best and will not and will never be given the priority that it needs. I hope that's answering that. Great, thank you. Well, would any of our other panelists like to come in on that question, Jessica? Well, well, I just I just wanted to add, and I suppose a, a slight defence of um, councillors and officers. So, I, I, as you mentioned at the start, I've, I've sort of seen it from both sides. So, I've been involved with um, a, a local community group um, around the old Kent Road and the development there. And then for the past year, I've been been um, working alongside uh, planning officers and um, councillors. And um, I think yeah, a, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of them, not all of them, but but a lot of them really genuinely do want to do engagement well and really do kind of want to know how and will, you know you know really want to sort of learn from the manifesto and what's being discussed today and what what people are saying. But um, one, as I mentioned before, one of the the problems is. Um, having the resources to actually to actually do that and to carry it out another is um the the kind of structure that that, that they're working in a it's it's very it's very political so there's a lot of care care about what can actually be said or what can be shown um councils also have to be accountable and that which is not, not necessarily a bad thing but that i find can be can also produce um, impose limitations as well as um, uh, as well as well as um, you know uh, back, backing backing up the process. So um, uh, I don't think I've really answered the question, but I did just want to put want to put in put in a slight defence, and I am quite excited. I do feel that there is that there there is an, an energy and a sea change and a lot of um, muscle and um, intent but I think that behind people gen people councils and communities genuinely and developers and architects genuinely wanting to do all that do engagement and public participation better fantastic thank you and I, yeah I think you're right that there does seem to be some um some positive movement from quite a lot of different directions on this at the moment, which is great. Um, I'm going to come to a question from Tony Burton now. And Tony says that today's new London plan identifies neighbourhood planning as a particularly good opportunity for communities to shape growth in their areas. Um, so the question then becomes, why do you think the mayor and borough officers and members do so little to support local communities using those, these powers, if indeed you agree that that is the case? Can I answer, Claire? Please do, yes. Because it's hard. It's really, really hard. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, there's no easy way about it. And, um, and that's why it becomes an add-on. Um, and that's why some people can do it and some people can't, can't, can't do it. And it might be the size of the developer, we don't earn enough money, or it might be that the, the problems here are just too great. 
down the Old Kent Road, for example, the other tsunami of challenges that are coming to you are just too great to, um, to deal with. And I think that's the reason is, is that it's really hard. And I think that there is a lack of a clear concept of what we want to achieve with a community. And it has to take in board localism. It has to take in board uh, on board how the community is going to uh, benefit from things, how they're going to influence things. So we need a concept of what that looks like. So developers, counselors, and those who are making the uh, decisions have something to aim for, which can be achieved. But I would say the reason that they don't do it at the minute is because it's really, really hard. Yeah. And there's such a lack of resource. Uh, completely second that. I think, uh, and just to add to your point, Simon, it's not a turn on and turn off. You can't just go, oh, I'll do it today and then I'll forget about it forever. You've got to be committed. It has got to be sustainable. So actually, that's where the fear of, of getting involved is because we know this is not something you can just put away once you've opened that Pandora's box. So it is, it is in a too difficult box. Um. Yeah, I mean, I would also add that, that when we're talking about communities, we're not talking about one group of people who all have, have the same priorities and who all who all agree with each other uh, and want the same thing. I mean, I'd be doing that, um, engage on the Old Kent Road, for example, I'd be talking to local people. So you'd be talk, talk to one person, they'd say their priority is independent shops and small businesses. And then you talk to the next person, they'd say how great it was. As there was Sainsbury's had opened and it was really convenient for them to do their shopping. So... Yeah, um, it, yeah, it's difficult and it's complex. Yeah, I, I think we kind of need to develop then a way which can um, yeah. uh, accommodate that. Yeah, accommodate all of those differences. And, um, you know, you could start uh, consulting some young people in an area and by the time the regeneration is two thirds through, <laughs> they got families and kids of their own um, uh, growing up. So things are constantly changing. And, and this is part of the difficulty uh, of what we do. So we talk about platforms on which people can be supported throughout a regeneration to come up with their ideas, to come up with what their preferences are and so on. And you facilitate a platform rather than dictating to people, you're going to have some of that. You're going to have some of that and you're going to have some of that because so-and-so set up in, in the tower block up there. So we need something which is flexible enough over time that can change and meet the aspirations of the different communities which are there when we start. The ones that are there five years later and the ones who are going to be living there 20 years later. So I think kind of it, it, it's about that. It's about being able to accommodate that change, that regeneration and, you know, the changes that go on um, uh, uh, just just in general. I used to work in that office down at the Old Kent Road back in the uh, 1980s in a, as a drug abuse centre. I can tell you how much the old Kent Road and the communities have changed since the 1980s. If you'd if you'd have started um, if you started there, so we need to be able to accommodate that. But it's not easy. I was going to also add that you, you talked about facilitating. I also talk about enabling. I think when we work with local communities, we always talk about our job is just to be an enabler and. Um, we picked up the next question about how do we demystify the planning and planning process because the planning process is fixated on physical it's fixated on buildings and um you know what something looks like how tall it is how wide it is and all of those are whilst they are important they are just a route from my, in our perspective to get to the real the real important bit how do we create much more jobs in this community how do we make sure people have better life chances how do we reduce the gap between rich and poor how do we get people young people to stay in education or to have different routes into in it into growing their future careers whatever that might be you know those are the critical things that we should be focused on not the height or the whilst that's important not the physical things and i think that's how we demystify it because if you if, as a community we're brought into the fact that our, our you know our neighborhood needs needs to address the drug and alcohol use that's in the area our neighborhood has massive issues around health inequalities. Now, what's the route through to get to that? Regeneration is a big part of that, but that, that's the bit that we've got to get people um, involved in and get people to see as a community issue and as a community um, community's responsibility to solve it. And, and I use community in a really loose term, not just people. It's about politicians, it's about businesses, it's about local organizations. How do we all come together to solve those big fundamental issues that we've got, you know, we've got to deal with. And the physical buildings are just a route through to get there. 
Thank you. Thanks all. Really interesting. Um, going the top with these sorts of events is that people pick up so many really interesting directions, and each of those feel like they could be the next half hour's discussion in themselves. I'm going to do something anti-democratic, which I maybe shouldn't do in a session with this particular theme and choose a question that's a little bit lower down the voting list now, just because I think it's a really good follow up to that one, um, which, which asks, beyond getting built environment professionals to value and do engagement better, how do we demystify a word that's already been used, planning for the public? And I would add, particularly importantly, make it something that's enjoyable to be involved in. I would follow on because I think the, the point I made earlier is is exactly that you know you you know enjoyable is actually you're you are being a you are contributing to the development of your of the place that you live your work you play you enjoy yourself you're gonna your children are gonna grow up in that's the that's for me that is the most important bit you know you're an active citizen in a place that you you call home you know whatever, whatever, whenever that might be that's one and I think for me, the second part is we have to make it easier to engage, you know, uh, and we've been, we've been using lots and lots of tools. Lockdown has probably influenced lots of developers doing it, but we've been doing it for a while where we, we push out a multi-layered approach to engaging, you know, really hands-on, really face-to-face, -face, but also digital use, social media. How do we gamify the experience and actually ask people proper questions rather than just say tick box, you know, it's, what is important to you? Show me, picture led, very image heavy, you know, but it's, it's and, and it's meeting you at your comfort. So, so if you're an active user of Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, that's where, that's where you would get that information. If you live in an area, it will geolocate you and you'll make sure that that is pushed to your mobile. So it's trying to find better and easier and or be enjoyable ways to reach people rather than just focusing on the usual stuff because it's what we, it's what we always do. Brilliant, thank you. Simon or Jessica, would you like to come in on that briefly? Um, I would say one, one thing that this year, year has done is actually pushed us towards actually embracing more dif different types, of different medium through which we can engage. I would, I would, um, in particular digital, but yeah, I, I would definitely <laughs> welcome the idea of um, events and engagement that's fun. Um, it also uh, touches on what I was saying earlier about using people with transferable skills, um, creative, creative people, um, yeah, yeah, jour journalists, people, interpreters, etc. Thinking more creatively about who who it is that actually does the engagement. There are some really brilliant projects being done. There's some great architect really fun stuff like you know, Marth. We made that. Said CD. Uh, what if you know? lots of them have lots of fun um there's um the urban rooms network people like diane diva down in um folkestone do does kind of really fun creative creative work um you know you can do people you know, walking tours hands-on model making you know all sorts we try to do some of that in our events on the old kent road um and then also in terms of demystifying i think the idea of um of, of having something that's more ongoing and more sustainable, having some, um, uh, and, and that's probably quite key. And also one interesting thing, I think it's Dundee, Dundee City Council I was talking to who have um, got uh, their, their regenerate, they've got eight mile long regeneration of the waterfront and that's um, been worked into the um, primary school curriculum. Um, so, it, so it's um, being communicated at a really, really fundamental level. I mean, I can't vouch for how for how much fun it is <laughs> is at school, but um, I think things like that are, are are crucial and well worth exploring. Thank you. I'm going to um, move to a question about how the the power of the mayor, um, grassroots organisations, and local local authorities now. Um, and, as the commentator, commenter um, Wilfred has observed, the power of the mayor of London is in some ways quite minimal. Um, he or she is, is quite restricted in what they can do. And we're going to keep saying he or she because, you know, one day we might have a woman mayor in that city. Um, sometimes it feels like it will never happen, but I'm quite determined that it will. Um, and sometimes the council simply ignore the mayor's position. Um, I understand that it's a debatable point in itself. Uh, where does the panel see grassroots organisations being able to support the mayor in strengthening that position? Um, particularly where there are um, quite an entrenched political, where there is quite an entrenched political system at the moment. 
Can I have a go? Yes, please. I'm glad I didn't get demystifying the planning process. I mean, regeneration's hard. Try that. Wow. Um, I kind of, yeah, um, the mayor does have uh, minimal powers to do this. Um, that's true. But he's also, uh, she would also be uh, a very influential figure in London if they put their weight behind this. Yeah, if they said this is going to happen. And I also think that they could lead by example. Because um, the mayor and the GLA do have their own sites. You know, I can think of several sites that they've got that they're developing themselves where they can set up exemplar schemes uh, to achieve this uh, community, de uh, community development, that they can have that around a, a, a clear framework um, uh, and they can award themselves uh, accreditations um, to do this. And then they can share best practice. But unfortunately, and, and we have so many examples of it, and um, I don't want to be overly critical of the councils or the developers, because I think many of them have made great strides um, towards this when they're, um, uh, when they're interviewing. I've been on a number of, uh, with developers on a number of kind of panels, and they're marking this sort of thing, who will get the, the uh, who will be the, uh, the preferred partner, whoever it is, that they do score on um uh on on um on 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 community on, on community development but i don't think that the exchange of best practice is enough yeah we've been doing it it just ain't working people like a large head doing it yeah that's great if uh, Aladi was in charge of all the development in london i'd sit here being very very happy very very happy indeed but the problem is is Aladi is probably a minority in, um, uh, in, in, in that industry. And that's why we need some, some kind of benchmark. Yeah. And developers do it for other things. As I say, consider a constructor or health and safety or the environmental standards that they're going to, uh, going to meet. Why not on social sustainability and stewardship? as well and i think that the mayor thanks Simon. Does sorry, have it. Sorry, yep, sorry sorry to cut you off we have two minutes left and i'm really Thanks, keen fun. to hear from elide and jessica on that question as well no oh, i i couldn't agree more you know we should, as a developer we should be judged on the depth the quality of our engagement and our ability to sustain that sustain that engagement and actually if you don't do it next time you bid for something you won't get it <laughs> that's that's fact because actually that's if that's a fundamental part of if we fundamentally believe that's so important why should you win anything else if you haven't made the effort the first time you were awarded Brilliant, thank you. Um, Jessica, would you, would you like to have the final word on this one? Um, I don't know if I've got anything um, extra to add, but you know, yeah, yes, absolutely would support um, yeah, more grassroots community involved. Um, things we haven't discussed that, that are for other sessions are things like community land trusts and, and ways of not just getting in, involved with, in the engagement and planning process, but really taking on the responsi responsibility and the power for actually um, build community um, building things themselves. Thank you. And um, I'm going to call it a day now for questions. There have been so many fantastic questions in here and um, we could we could keep on answering them all day. Um, if we haven't got to yours, I'm sorry. It doesn't mean that we haven't read it or that we're not interested in it. And um, we really do intend, as I know other people in this room do today, to keep on working on this, keep on shouting about it. This is um, this is just the launch event. Um, it's such a big priority. So um, your thoughts are not lost, I promise. We have read them all and we will continue to. Um, thank you also to those who've been um, sharing that their ideas with us in the chat. Um, I guess all that remains for me to say is um, thank you so much to our brilliant speakers and also um, Richard to his, for his presentation at the beginning of the session. It's been such a pleasure to have you all with us. Um, thank you, of course, to the audience um, for the questions, for being involved. Um, I can see that there's already stuff going on on social media, which is great. And thank you once again to Footwork, our partner in this project, and to CCA for the collaboration, Collective Community Action for the collaboration. Um, at Centre for London, we always have more research and webinars coming up. I always say this, so um, please do sign up to our newsletter and follow us on Twitter to keep in touch. Um, in particular, we've got one next week on how lighting is used in London, which is a really important practical demonstration of how involving communities in this one very arguably narrow aspect of built environment can have a really big impact on quality of life and use of space. Um, 
Of course, if you are interested in funding a Centre for London project or event just like this one, then please do get in touch with us. Um, thank you once again to our speakers and goodbye. Thank you.